welcome to Unfinished Business Interview. And I am your host, as always, Jeffrey Galishaw, or Jeff Galishaw. And with me, as always, is tactical support co-host extraordinaire, Andre Joseph of AJ Epics Productions. I believe in the hair good of all people. Okay. <laughs> Great quote. Um, at, as you know, this is Unfinished Business Interview. So with us today, we have a very special guest. And right now it's time for my James Lipton Inside the Actor Studio moment. As you can see, we have a special guest with us today. We have a man, an accomplished actor, who has acted and starred in so many movies, there are too many to name or cover completely. He has played historical figures, heroes, anti-heroes, rogues, and quite a few villains, from cult victims to leaders, mobsters, and even the Antichrist. He has worked with a who's who of fellow stars, directors, actors, writers. He has been a working actor for over four decades, currently working on a fifth. A playwright, an author, a Genie Award winner, a Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Speaks three languages that we know of. <laughs> star of stage, screen, and television. We are honored and very lucky to have with us today legendary actor, Nick Mancuso, thank you for being here on Unfinished Business. You're welcome, and it's uh, it's great to be here. And uh, and Andre, it's great to hear your voice again after the, all those many years. I, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah, I've been in the business a long, long time, and uh, it's been almost uh, 45 years of of acting. And uh, forgive me for not showing my face. I'm tired of seeing it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, I'm not retired. I, I'm still writing and acting. And uh, and I guess, you know, once you're an actor, then you, you, you stay an actor, basically. You know, old actors never die. They just sort of act their way into extinction. And, uh, you know, I, I've, been, uh, I've been writing and doing theater in the last number of years. Um, you know, the shows that I've, uh, that I've written small films that i've uh, produced and and written uh, you know it's uh it's a it is a process that i you know i never went into it for the fame and the money uh, it was always for me a vocation i always say that acting and i guess the arts is a vocation rather than a profession a vocation is something you called you're called to do i guess i was called to do it uh, it wasn't certainly my intention as a young person to be an actor, I, I was into oh, the sciences when I was a kid, and it was just a fluke of fate that I ended up acting in a high school play back in 1965 and uh, or 64. My high school teacher um, got very excited after he got me to stand up and recite uh, a poem that I had to memorize. They used to have a pretty... Uh, fast memory and we were always competing to see who could memorize the quickest and uh, so I got up and I uh, recited the poem after I think five minutes and he got slapped his hands together Dr. Tripp his name was and he said you're joining the drama club and I, I had no idea what drama was and uh, and I said and I said oh okay so then uh, so I was forced into it basically and uh, the moment I started doing it, I thought, what the heck is this? I, we were doing Hamlet. Uh, I was 16. I was playing Larrities. He made me assistant director, and I fell in love with William Shakespeare. I started recording uh, the entire play and listening to it. I listened to Sir John Gilgud's recording back in 1942, I think it was. And, uh, and I, began to, uh, I began to imitate what I heard. But I was doing it for kicks all the way through high school and university. Um, I graduated in research psychology. But I was doing the theater uh, in the university. I went to the University of Guelph, University of Toronto. And uh, but it, I never thought in a million years I'd end up making it my profession. But Destiny stepped in, and uh, I started working almost immediately back in the, the late 60s. And I haven't stopped since. So... So this is uh, this is my story. I'm sticking to it. I think uh, <laughs> acting is a is a is a is a is a noble art, or it can be, uh, you know, done done correctly. And uh, 
and worthwhile doing. But nowadays, of course, everybody's an artist, everybody's an actor, everybody's on Facebook, everybody's on faces are everywhere. That's why I'm not showing mine. <laughs> I don't. It's like it's so crazy. Everybody's so comfortable in front of the camera. I was never comfortable in front of the camera. It was a very awkward thing. It took me a long time to get used to it. I started my first motion picture for Columbia in 1976, a picture called Nightwing, directed by Arthur Hiller, produced by Marty Ransohoff, uh, Oscar-winning uh, people. Uh, and I was I was a star of it. And it was a gigantic flop. And, uh, and that was my introduction to Hollywood. But before that, I had done a whole bunch of little films in Canada uh, for the CBC, and I'd done theater at Stratford. I was doing Shakespeare and the underground theaters of Toronto. I did that for many years, um, out of which many, many artists uh, emerged. Uh, people from all the way from, uh, you know, Keanu Reeves and Jim Carrey and Michael and Dace, who were an English patient, Des Mackinoff, who did Jersey Boys on Broadway. It was a very exciting time. The 60s, there was a tremendous foment um, uh, of creativity. And uh, but it was not certainly what it is today, you know. I mean, my God, in those days in Canada, I knew every actor in Canada. There were only about a couple of hundred of us in the entire country. I worked from Vancouver uh, to Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, all that, and then brought down to Hollywood in 1976 to star in the French motion picture and started acting in film and television for the next 40 years. So, um, that's what I've done. This has been my life's work. Um, it's been an interesting life, to say the least. Uh, certainly a strange life, uh, to say the least. Uh, a certain, uh, a certain one to live one's life pretending to be other people, speaking other people's lines and thinking other people's thoughts. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm now uh, in my 70s, and I'm still doing it. Uh, so... There it is. Um, you know, we, uh, I guess, you know, it's, we do, you know, you said the thing about love is true. It was love really that, that, that made me do it. And uh, because I loved to do it. I don't know why. I don't know why I did. Because it certainly wasn't because I wanted to be famous. I don't like being famous. Uh, and I didn't, uh, and I was very shy. It was just something that called to me, and I said, vocation. So if you're, the people listening, if you're called to it, I guess you have to do it. You know? And uh, But but nowadays, as I say, Andre, it's just so weird because, you know, everybody's now their own network. They're, you know, they're all starring in their own shows, and and uh, <laughs> it's so bizarre for me. Uh, it takes about seven years to learn the basics of uh, the craft of acting. It took me about seven years on stage. I did 20 years of theater before I went to uh, do it. So anyway, I'm ranting and rambling. <laughs> it's all good, Nick. Um, yeah. You know, I, I want to talk to you about some of your notable roles because there's so much. You have such a huge body of work and so many different characters that you played over the decades. Um, the one that I think most people probably would stand out for you on film was uh, Ticket to Heaven. You know, that dealing with a topic that I think is even more relevant now than it was in 1981, what kind of preparation did you have to get into the David role for that? Well, you know, it's like I'm basically known for, you know, Ticket to Heaven, Stingray, um, the, uh, the, the End of Siege movies with Steve Seagal, and the uh, the Christian movies and and a film I just go believe it or not very very first thing I ever did was a thing called Black Christmas, which became a huge cult hit. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but Ticket to Heaven was 1981, was one of the first parts uh, I ever had that were, there was really uh, a part, it was really a role. Um, in, in other words, it was about something. The story uh, ostensibly. Uh, well, not ostensibly, but in fact, was based on a true story, a book called uh, Moon Webs, about um, uh, a fellow from Montreal, his name was Benji Carroll, who had gone to San Francisco and, uh, at the time in, uh, where uh, 
the cults, which was in the 70s, uh, in, the, in the late 70s and so forth, there were a lot of cults. And uh, he got involved uh, with a cult uh, called the Monians, the Unification Church, which was very popular in those days. And, and basically what happened to him in a very short period of time, he became brainwashed became a Mooney and left his entire life behind and became this other person. Um, the, um, um, the film uh, was based on this man's life. And what happened was he finally, his family had to kidnap him and deprogram him. In other words, unbrainwash him from uh, this obsession that he had developed. Um, this was not you know, uncommon in those days. And it's still is not uncommon in these days either. Uh, you know, we had the, the Guyana, uh, you know, massacre that occurred with Jim Jones, you know, that was played uh, actually by, with a, by a brilliant actor that I also worked with, Powers Booth. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was the situation with uh, the Kurt, the um, uh, so many, many, many cults uh, that came and, and rose up. And, uh, and people were getting brainwashed. And um, so I had the opportunity to undergo the same process that uh, Benji, the character's name was David, uh, had gone through. And the director I was working with was a very good director by the name of Ralph Thomas, who also uh, wrote it, who came out of a documentary background in Canada. So it was done very kind of photorealistic in a sense. And so I put myself through exactly the same process, and I had the opportunity to do that. In other words, to prepare for the part, because you need preparation, time to do something. Um, and I put myself on more or less the same food he was on, the same sleeping pattern. I'll, I put my body through, really, through hell. I should never have done that because it damaged me met metabolically. I don't advise it. I was losing two pounds a day. By the end of the, or the beginning of the thing, he became a, almost like a concentration camp inmate that was on 800 calories a day. You know, this is around the time that Robert De Niro did Raging Ball, of course. Right. You know, and gained all this weight and, you know, became a boxer. But I had met De Niro years before. He trained for five years he, to, for the, the role of Jake LaMotta. And uh, I had two weeks. <laughs> and all, uh, so I had two weeks to prepare, and I studied. Uh, I met with uh, the fellow that got through, and I, I went on the streets of Toronto and, and started to recruit people. He showed me how to do it. I studied films. I froze. I studied their eyes. I, I managed to actually photorealistically transform myself. Got my pupils to dilate and stay dilated. I was uh, in fight or flight mood most of the time, called the androgenic response, uh, and altered my, my metabolism so that I could, in fact, be transformed as the character David was, as Benji had undergone this transformation. So I had an opportunity to do that, and because of it, uh, the film made a great big splash. Uh, they had well, I won the Canadian Oscar for it, but it was actually uh, submitted for an American Oscar and for the Golden Globe, which I was supposed to get, but fortunately the film was disqualified because it was released by MGM. It was a foreign film. And anyway, it was disqualified, and so I never got the nomination. But it was one of those parts that an actor gets rarely in a lifetime. If you get it three times in a lifetime, you're, you've done good, you know. The, the Japanese uh, theater founders of Kabuki, Shiami, uh, wrote a book called The Secret of the Transmission of the Flower, which deals with the nature of the art of acting, and uh, written in the 15th century, and argued that, that an actor is like, you might say, a cherry tree, can blossom five times. So the maximum number of sort of performance you can actually give in a lifetime is five. I figured I've done maybe, I don't know, two, uh, if that's maybe three. Um, that is, that are performances, you know, that are real performances. And uh, it's very rare to get them. And Ticket to Heaven was certainly uh, the one that uh, I had a chance and a crack to, to do some real work. 
But most of the time, it's comic book stuff. You know, it's caricature. It's it's um, you know, and uh, uh, you know, you you're basically you're doing sketch work. You're not really getting an opportunity. In any one given year in the film business, there's always one or two or three great performances. You know, for example, Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker yeah. is a great performance. You know, uh, Robert Nero uh, in Raging Bull is a truly great performance. Pacino in The Godfather and many other films, of course. Brando, you know, in uh, Waterfront. Uh, there are only certain number of parts, and particularly in film, that will ever entice one to, 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 to jump the distance, you know? It's like being an athlete, you know, the high jump, and uh, and trying to, to get, the, you know, the hurdle, you know, and really push yourself to the limits. And uh, and uh, my cousin was uh, was an Olympic athlete and uh, American Olympic athlete, who unfortunately never got to the Olympics because uh, the plug was pulled uh, the year that uh, he took part of the Moscow Olympics. He was a decathlete. He had beaten Bruce Jenner's record. This guy was a great athlete and in constant training uh, and had that opportunity pulled at the last pitch. He never recovered from it because he never, he had spent a lifetime preparing. Well, you know, uh, actors are the same as in some ways connected to, to athletic uh, performance. We're emotional athletes. And certain performances asks that you give it your all and ticket was certainly one of them uh not too many others have come since uh but you know one strives i i've written some material um that i i've you know tried to uh, to give myself the opportunity of really having some material you know mostly in the form of one man shows that i've done in the past um, one of whom is it, one of uh, which is piece I wrote, which is being done at the Romanian National Theater, which was an adaptation from the book of Job. And um, and I've, I've written other pieces, uh, and I call them psychologues. One is called Hotel Praha, which uh, was my reaction to being in uh, Czechoslovakia during the communist years and what it was like uh, during that time. And another piece called Moscow Dog. I mean, there are certain things that I've done uh, that, you know, never made any uh, huge uh, success of any kind. I mean, you know, they're totally unknown as far as the business goes, but I did them for to to try to do something, you know, because I I never really got a crack at the, you know uh, the great parts because the great parts only come, uh, you know, the, uh, really uh, for most that most of them, most actors never get a chance. To, uh, to really, you know, do the, uh, to do the work. So the theater is still the place where an actor can, at least, even if no one sees it, and most of the time, you know, people don't see it, um, you know, when you already, uh, only a few people see it, where, where an actor can, can actually push himself to, the, to that part, that, to that point. So you need to find those roles, you know, and there's only a handful of them, and most of them are in the theater. Uh, an actor can only be as good on film as his director. So, uh, you know, you don't get, uh, you know, you won't get the great performances unless you've got a great director because an actor, so you've got Marlon Brando alive because you've got, you know, and Coppola, you've got Guillermo and Scorsese. So, so, there's only a handful of great directors and one's only a handful of parts. So the actor is in a position nowadays where while there's more acting than ever in the history of the world, if you think of the number of performance about floating through the, through the air right now as we speak, on the internet, the airwaves, and so forth, hundreds of thousands of performances are, even though that is true, it's very rare that actually the deep and real performances of history are passing through. I, I have always been fascinated by the art of acting. And, you know, my, my heroes were guys who are totally like uh, Eleonora Duce or Tommaso Salvini, turn of the century, Henry Irving, the British actor, Keane, Herbert. Uh, throughout history, there have been certain, and Brando in our time, uh, there have been certain actors that have had an impact on consciousness 
itself. Now, this is, sounds really pretentious, and it is pretentious, but the thing is, you know, if, you, if, if, if it's not going to be, you know, a, a, a challenge, well, what's the point of doing it? You, know, you might as well just you know, get a, a, a much easier job, because being an actor is not an easy proposition. Most of the time, you get screwed over. You know, you, you no matter how much money you make, the money is going to be uh, stolen or taken from you. Uh, are you going to rarely are you going to be able to have a, a life? Most, you know, most actors uh, don't survive their own life. That's a fact, uh, with some exceptions. And um, if they, in fact, do dedicate themselves to, quote, the work, but not a good idea. I don't recommend it. And, uh, but on the other hand, as I say, it's a vocation. And you know what? It's a lot of fun. I've traveled around the world. I've played, uh, I've gone through all five stages of the actor's career. Stage one being, you know, the ingenue, the lover. Uh, stage two being the hero. I played heroes for years. And uh, then I played the villains. That's stage three. And then I played the losers, stage four. And then stage five, you play the monster. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've done all five and continue to do them. The human condition is an interesting proposition, to say the least, as Clifford Odets wrote. I did his play uh, Paradise Lost with the CBC back in 1972. And, uh, you know, one of the great playwrights. And I had the great honor of working with Tennessee Williams, one of the great uh, playwrights of our age, along with Eugene O'Neill. Of course, this man uh, no longer remembered. Uh, of course, wrote Streetcar Named Desire, among many, many other great films. So, uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and and uh, so many great plays. Uh, and gave uh, the opportunity for Marlon Brando and Paul Newman and Nana Mignani and and uh, and uh, and all the great actors of his time to truly give great performances. I had the honor of working with him in Atlanta, Georgia, back in. 1978, uh, on one of his last plays, a play called Tiger Tale, and worked with him directly, which was, and then worked again with him a few years later in Night of the Iguana. And uh, one of the great moments in my life as an actor was to stand on stage with him, to a standing ovation, uh, having performed uh, Tiger Tale, and uh, which of course went nowhere. Uh, it was before I started my career in Hollywood. So, uh, yeah, it's it's been a lot. I guess you might say a life worth living um, because it's, uh, but it certainly has not been an easy one and continues not to be an easy one. It is a struggle, but then all lives are difficult for us. The thing is, if we can make the effort, then we can get to that point, that little pause, you know, where we, we look, we can look around a little bit and say, you know, I climbed this mountain. And I and I can breathe the air, and I can see the distance, you know. And uh, and that's what we're doing, you know. So it's important to kind of like strive, I guess, you know, to not go and wax philosophical, which I do anyway, um, you know, to strive for something. So I keep trying to strive. Right now, I'm working on a play, on a one man show on Frank Sinatra. Yeah, yeah. In the in the next year. Um, and it's taken me six years to write, uh, and uh, I've been, uh, I've been, I'm now coming, I was ill for a while, but now I'm back in my health, so I'm able to start working again, and I'm going to start, uh, you know, striving to the next stage. Old actors, as I say, never die, they just continue, they act their way into, into eternity, you know, to the abyss, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, I'm very sorry to go on and on, but that's fine, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, why Frank Sinatra for a one-man show? Mm. It's very strange, very strange, because I certainly was not uh, a fan of Frank Sinatra's. When I was a, you know, a kid, it was my generation. We were into, you know, the Rolling Stones at my time in the 60s, you know, and uh, Dylan, Bob Dylan, all that was my kind of music. But my first wife uh, was uh, totally fascinated. I was living in Los Angeles doing more movies. My first wife loved Frank Sinatra. Well, it's just that we go to the Hollywood Bowl to see him. The last thing I wanted to do was go see Frank Sinatra because he was, quote, you know, square on uh, the establishment in those days. 
Well, I said, okay, fine. So we went. And I'll tell you what happened to me was uh, I had an interesting kind of psychic uh, or psychological kind of almost spiritual experience. Uh, he came on stage and it was, uh, I was literally thrown back in my seat. It was like watching a Roman emperor enter the, the stage. I saw him literally hold the entire audience in his hand. And then he snapped his finger and the music took off and I was just taken on a musical journey. I could see and hear him hear every sharp, every flat, every instrument seemed to go through him. And then absorbed it into the system and this music came out and I was gone. You know, I, I was like amazed. And, uh, and that experience stayed with me for many years. And that had only happened to me uh, one other time, which when I saw, it sounds very esoteric, but I saw the great Kabuki actor Denjiro the Twelfth um, uh, at Royce Hall at UCLA. The Denjiros of Kabuki theater are actors that the other actors of that generation vote on because the the Kabuki actors have titles like Duke or, or, or thing and so forth. And the Danjuro is like the Pope of the actors and been around since the 1580s. Or oh, as I said, Xiaomi and Son, equal to the transmission of the flower, uh, who wrote uh, one of the first acting manual. Um, uh, and uh, I went to go see Danjuro the 12th. There had been 12 to Danjuro's going back to the 1585. There hadn't, 1585. There hadn't been one in 80 years because nobody was had it was worthy of the title and and he was and uh and watching him go on or come on stage again the sensation of being thrown back on my seat sinatra had done the same thing to me so that sensation that what is this thing you know who is he well years later i was shooting a film with charles Coleman terry robert dobby and usher uh, a, a mafia comedy, and uh, and Robert Dobby kept looking at me while we were filming this scene under a bridge, and kept looking at me strangely. And I said to Robert, uh, Robert, uh, you know, what's uh, what's 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 with the look? And he said, he says to me, he goes, Nick, I got to tell you, man, you're the spitting image of Frank Sinatra. And I said, What are you talking about? He said, He said, I worked with Frank when I was 22 on a film called Contract on Cherry Street. And I swear, he said, I'm standing in front of him again. He said, you got to write a play about Frank. And I said, I don't know, you Frank Sinatra. He said, so he, every day Robert would come in and say, you write that play, you write that play. And I go, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, Frank Sinatra, I'm not going to. Anyway, I forgot about it. And years later, a strange set of kind of circumstances occurred. I had an agent. Um, who happened to have been born a few miles away from where I was born in a small town in the south of Italy. I was born in the south of Italy, and my family migrated when I was six years old to Canada, which is how I became a, an American. And um, and um, and she was an agent, and uh, and she had a very strange set of experiences. She used to get these headaches. They were like she told me they were like blackout. She would blackout. They were migraine. And uh, she said one night, and she would see things. And she was going to doctors. And this one urologist said to her, what you have is not really a disease. It's a condition. It's been found among certain women in the Mediterranean for thousands of years. The ancient prophecy, prophetesses, uh, the pinion prophetesses of ancient Greece, the the uh, uh, the the um, Sibylline prophets of ancient Rome, you know, all over the Mediterranean were these women that could see things. And she so this is what you've got. You've got a condition. In other words, prophetic powers. So um so um she said I, I she said I was in my bathtub and all of a sudden she said I started to black out and I had this vision uh and something you were there standing in front of me as Frank Sinatra. Now, when she told me this, I know this sounds kind of weird. Uh, 
I felt this energy going through my belly, and I, that night I went home to my office, and I, I started to write the play. And, uh, and that's how it all began. And I, and I, I wrote, it took me almost six years, um, and I felt very strongly that Frank Sinatra had channeled it to me. It's a cautionary tale, to say the least. And I believe that, uh, and it begins really with the, the first line, the, the, which is, uh, for what does it profit a man if he gaineth the world and loses his soul? And, um, and in many ways, I think uh, the story of Frank Sinatra is the story of America, which has undergone this transformation uh, in the last uh, 40 years of my time, where it has gained the world and lost its soul. And I think it's an important theme um, to deal with. So I wrote it, and and I've got a tremendous amount of material. My problem now is is uh, I need to get it down to reasonable size. I have a director who wants to work on it. We have absolutely zero funding, but we're going, he is a famous director actually in Romania at the National Theater, and um, where one of my plays is being done, one of my plays was translated uh, into Romanian plays of the National Theater, the uh, that one that was based on the Book of Job, called God Is a Gangster, and um, so that uh, it was uh, the why I was working on Sinatra. But I don't feel too inspired yet to really um, focus in on it, and that's what I'm working on is try to get myself back, you know, on the horse and start riding it again. So before you go, I want to ask you a question about Stingray, because the first time I actually watched the pilot was uh, my dad who's a dentist. He uh, he had a friend at a lab who had a bunch of old Miami Vice tapes because I was like a big Miami Vice fan. I was looking for all the reruns. He recorded the pilot episode on one of those tapes. And I remember watching because it had the same kind of MTV style and I was like really into it. Then I got the box set years later and watched the entire series. And clearly that show to me was like a tour de force for you because she played all these different disguises and, you know, you got to do the martial arts, you got to do all this cool stuff, you know? Yeah. And one question I have now, I know your secret about not wanting to say who he really was. And that's cool. Like that should remain a mystery forever. But my question is, did you and Stevie J. Cannell ever discuss who he actually is? And do you think the audience would have ever found out if the show had gone on longer? Well, if the show had gone on longer, of course, there'd be more and more uh, evidence. But I'll tell you the story of the formation of Stingray. You know, I met Steve Cannell in 1976. I was brought out there by ABC and introduced to him to do a pilot called, um, originally called Shack. And then uh, it changed to, uh, it became Dr. Scorpion. Anyway, it was a failed pilot. And, um, and uh, with that, actually with this very nice actors, Ross Lee Brown and, and uh, Christine Lottie. And, and uh, anyway, um, what happened was we started working on the pilot. And, you know, Steve had asked me, because I, I was under option to ABC, what I thought of the script. And I honestly said to him, it sucks. And, uh, and Steve, who the man he was, you know, instead of throwing me out of the office, said, you're right. He said, you, it does suck. Come and write it with me. So we got together and we started creating this character. Well, this character, years later, was the character of Stingray. It became Stingray. I wanted to play different parts uh, in, in, uh, in, in under the guise of the CIA operative and so forth because I couldn't stand the idea of, uh, you know, coming into a room with a gun and saying, freeze, you know, uh, or, you know, uh, yeah, the usual kind of standard, you know, shoot them up and stuff like that. I said, I really don't want to do a show with the guns, you know, the shooting and all that. You know, I want to act, you know, do some stuff. Listen. So the, so we came up with him going disguises and all that. Well, that pilot was not picked up, but years later, he called me up. And uh, Brandon Tartikoff, head of NBC, had asked him to come up with something with a car. And uh, and he came up with this guy called Stingray, who dro drove a Stingray car. And, uh, and uh, 
decided to bring in that kind of character in it. Stingray was as this mystery man who, you know, had different. But uh, so basically, really, what I'm thinking was is basically it was the actor. You know, Stingray is the actor playing the part, and uh, and the mystery of personality, or the mystery of who are we and who are you. You know, are you what you do, or are you what you know want to do? Are you, you know, what is the essence of a human being? We know that, you know, the favorite thing I think he got from uh, the Godfather. You know, uh, one day I'll come to you and I'll ask you for a or whatever it is. Uh, you must do it. So it would have been one of those premises that would have made it possible to continue. The show itself was actually a hit, and NBC didn't know that. We were getting 22s uh, and 23s. The opening night, we got a 48, one of the biggest shares uh, in uh, uh, for a show that ever opened. The show had already been canceled before it was picked up. But the numbers were so high, they reordered it. And that's why we shot the first 13 and then the 22. When the show was on air, it was doing 22s and 23s. Miami Vice was doing, I think, 29. And, uh, and we were rapidly going up the scale, but Michael Mann had a new show. And after being reordered the second season, they needed the slot. We were the new kid on the block. They pulled Stingray and put in Michael's show, which ended up getting 12s and 13s. Two years later, and BC realized they canceled a hit, tried to reorder it, and, they could, and I couldn't do it because I was doing another series that went nowhere called Matrix. Uh, which, strangely enough, was also starring Car- the, uh, the Moss, Carrie Ann <laughs> the actual movie Matrix. So it's, it's a very interesting kind of strange conjunction of forces that uh, went into Stingray. But I know it became very, very popular, cult hit uh, all over the world, uh, and, um, and to this day still seems to have an impact uh, on, uh, on the audience. Mm-hmm. It's good to meet you guys. I've enjoyed uh, my rant and uh, discussing <laughs> with you guys. And I sent you some clips if you want to show some stuff uh, with the with the show. That would be great. Yeah, with that at the tail end. Yeah, but uh, it's good to good to to catch up a little bit, Andre. I've always yeah, you too, Nick. And, uh, nice meeting you uh, as well. I'm sorry. What's your name? As well? uh, Jeff uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dalton. Jeff, it's great to meet you. And, nice uh, to meet you, sir. Yeah. God bless you both. And uh, onwards and upwards uh, we go. Take care. All right. Take care, Nick. Thank you. Now in my last 45, I've decided to kill myself. I can't fucking take this anymore. I'm going to go. Danforth Bridge, I'm gonna stand there and I'm gonna jump off. Now, this picture that I've been working on, right? I'm trying to get financing on. I'm gonna meet with the investor next week. He's this young, hotshot investor. He's got lots of women. He lives at the Thompson Hotel. He's a hotshot. And, uh, and he said that he might put up money for the film that I'm producing, that I'm doing right now. This very film that you're watching, right now because this is actually happening this is real this is not bullshit this is really happening i really am going to jump off the fucking bridge riders on the storm riders on the storm Sweet. <laughs> who's weenie are we talking about cooking no no seriously we're talking about cooking the weenie but yeah. who's weenie are we cooking <laughs> There's a killer on the road. His brain is squirming like a toad. Take a long holiday. Let your children play. If you give this man a ride, speak well, you will die. Better than you, my son. Son, I'm not anybody's son.
The Bumpy Club of One Million BC. I cannot hate you. Come on, come on, you can do it. Come on! Come shit. Shut up. I'm trying to concentrate here. I'm trying to write some poetry. What the hell's the matter with you, Eddie? Shut up. Here is Gregory Corson. And he cries and he cries. Bravo. Bravo. Kids a poet. You're a poet, kid. In the last bird massacre, one absurd bird will remain. And he won't know how to sing. And the absurd bird will be an unready bird. Slow, very slow. Let's have a drink. Yeah, 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 yeah. What I said was, God is no masturbator. He's no masturbator. He's no revolutionary, you dig? There's no retirement home. home. Not like you, you retire and you drink tea. You gotta go, man. You gotta go and get on the road. Long time ago, I aimed to fight me. They is me. A warrior from the Aspromonte Mountains. And my grandmother lived in a cave. I'm a Calabrian. Gosh, lion. Not whiskey. Orange juice. Fuck no, I'm an American clown. So no pagliaccio. Ridetevi pagliacci. Mauricio. Mauricio. I'm here. Open the door. Riders on the storm Riders on the storm Into this house we're born Into this world we're thrown Like a dog with I used to live here.
My memory isn't quite what it once was. Wa e a e. So, I know damn well there's something you want to talk to me about. I've never seen you in a theater on an off day unless it was a dead actor. My mother may have been a lot of things, all of which are etched deeply into my memory. I beg your pardon. Men, boys, someone for you to see me with. Why is that necessary? You have issues, Victor, and I'm just trying to help you address them. Ning, 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 ning. What in God's name are you yowling about? She is exactly like my mother, a royal pain in the ass. You can sit if you want. I am not comfortable going into a deep conversation with you if you're standing and drinking. This is how you see me. This is who I am. I don't like you drinking. You don't like Dennis drinking either. But you still drink. Uh, I, I have it under control. Oh, and nobody else does. No, not the people in my life. <clears throat> Who are you to judge? What makes you so goddamn clever? I never understood you, mother. Nothing about you. You never understood anyone, Victor. Isn't that why we're all here? Don't turn this around. <coughs> Gotta stop smoking. Turn it around. I'm just not saying what you want me to say. What is it that you'd want me to say? Do you want to write the words down for me? I want to know when. When what? When you stopped being a mother. I never said I wanted to stop. You stopped. You went away. You left. You got on a big old train to the coast with a man in a brown suit. How did you know? How would I know? How would I not know? I saw you get into that taxi. A oh, mother to do that. I am going home. I think the hour is far too late for this kind of nonsense. Now you've had a breakthrough. You need to keep pushing. You need to trust in me. You? are a drunk, and I cannot take a drunk seriously. All right, let us proceed. Oh, good God. Good men. The last way by. Crying. How bright their frail deeds. might have danced in a green bay. Rage. Rage. Against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there, on that sad height. Curse, bless me now. With your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying. Of the light! Excellent. Excellent.